are in the world. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for this um, Human Rights Council side event on emerging challenges to freedom of religion or belief. Um, I'm Mervyn Thomas. I'm the founder and president of CSW, uh, an international human rights organization working to protect and promote the right to freedom of religion or belief for people of all faiths and none. And uh, we do that through research and advocacy. And uh, I'm thrilled to say that we've uh, got a panel of absolute top class expert speakers with us this afternoon. Uh, but before I introduce our first speaker, can I just say um, to everybody who's, who's part of this um, uh, event this afternoon, if you have questions during the, uh, during the speakers as, as they're speaking or at any time, please do put them in the, in the chat. And uh, we will, uh, if we have time after the speakers, we'll put those questions to them. We will prioritize questions from member states. So if you identify who you are uh, when you put the questions up, um, we would appreciate that. So we'll go to our first speaker this afternoon. And uh, as, um, as this is a United Nations Human Rights Council event, we are, uh, it's very appropriate that we start with the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Religion or Belief, Dr. Ahmed Shahid. And Dr. Shahid has held that mandate um, since 2016. And uh, uh, he's also the, the Deputy Director of the Essex Human Rights Centre. Uh, prior to that, he was the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on the situation of human rights in Iran from 2011 to 2016. And even before that, he was, um, uh, twice has held the Office of Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Maldives. Uh, we are very pleased that you're able to join us today. Over to you, Dr. Shahid. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin and CSW for first of all, convenient side event and also inviting me to speak today. It's a real pleasure to meet my fellow panelists and join you all in this important discussion this afternoon. I would like to talk about the nexus between freedom of expression and freedom of general belief, including hate speech and incitement to hate, especially important subject in a globalized world that we live in, the digital space that we occupy, and also in the pandemic when we live in very closed spaces. The link between these two freedoms is actually very close. And uh, the, even if all rights are interdependent, the link between these two rights are particularly close as we can see perhaps in the structure of these two rights, which, are, which is also broadly similar. Um, you know, both rights have a forum internum, the internal realm of our thoughts and opinions, which enjoys absolute protection without any uh, you know, limitation whatsoever that is permitted. At the same time, both rights also have an external dimension, that of manifestation or of, of expression. Uh, that, that, of course, can be limited, but only exceptionally so. And without that external dimension, without the freedom of ex expression, um, I think for many people, for most people, if not all, uh, religious freedom would have not much meaning because, you know, the, communicative, the, the element of communication is so important uh, for, the, for, this, uh, for, the, for this freedom. Around the world, we see a rising trends in suppression of freedom of expression from anti-blasphemy laws framed directly as criminalization of speech that offends religious sensibilities, or sometimes as public order laws, or as anti-conversion or anti apostasy laws, all of which restrict the space for people's expression of their thoughts and beliefs. A recent study by USERF showed that some 84 countries around the world had these laws which criminalized um, blasphemy in some form or the other, with penalties ranging from fines to imprisonment, imprisonment to death penalty in some cases. Now, of these, some 50 countries actively enforce these laws. And with, and with some 80% of the cases from the last five years coming from just 10 countries. And these, the report identifies, and as we often know, um, are Pakistan, Iran, Russia, India, Egypt, Indonesia, Yemen, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. Thus, some 84% of the enforcement of blasphemy laws occurs in the Asia Pacific and the Middle East region. And of course, the, 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 the case we come across uh, in our work, you know, testify to these incidents in this particular region. Now, these laws can be easily identified or recognized as among the oldest type of restrictions 
And we are familiar with many in some many recent cases, such as the ongoing case of Mubarak Bala in Nigeria, Janet Hafiz in Pakistan, Raif Badab in South, Saudi Arabia. And also we've seen in recently perhaps resolved cases, such as Asia Bibi from Pakistan or Mohammed Makatayr from Mauritania, that although they were finally released, it took years for them to be, find freedom. And of course, along the way, so many lives were destroyed, those who campaigned for their freedom. In talking about these two freedoms, you must also note those laws in secular contexts that prohibit the expression of one's beliefs through dress symbols, often targeting specific faith communities, which may sound recent and maybe dress up as, as modernity, but actually belong to a long lineage of majoritarian suppression of minority religious expression. And what is being done to the Uyghurs in China, for example, is an, is an example of how this can be stretched, how far this can be stretched to a level where there's absolutely no protections for one's uh, you know, expression of one's thoughts and belief. Now, however, by far the most dangerous restriction on speech are anti-blasphemy and anti-apostasy laws. Because in addition to the draconian penalties that states impose on, on those who, uh, who face delegations, these laws also embolden non-government actors to carry out violent attacks. In fact, more people die or get maimed in the hands of mobs than, than, than state would penalize them through the court system. So these laws actually have the toxic effect of, of in, in fact, you know, creating vigilante attacks. And in fact, um, in fact, attacks carry with, with impunity because states are unable to really enforce rule of law in those contexts. And of course, these laws also provide a link to hate speech in two ways. One, a false link, as it were, a false claim. The other, of course, a real one. And the false link, the alleged link, is that to insert religion should be heard because they amount to hate speech. They don't, uh, because this ignores two important points. One is that incitement to hatred, incitement to violence, and especially the three-party uh, offense. There is the speaker who would speak these words to an audience who they would seek to mobilize to attack a third party. So without that three-party connection, incitement to violence doesn't work. So direct insight to somebody's ideas, beliefs, and thoughts doesn't uh, amount to hate speech unless it was done with the intent to have a third party you know, attack uh, that, that person. And such insult to ideas and beliefs, religions, cannot be prohibited in a, in a democracy or one that respected human rights. But while we should, while we should and do reject anti-blasphemy laws, we must be mindful to counter hate speech that incites violence against persons. So while we should protect insult to ideas and beliefs and religions, we must be very watchful against any actions that incite violence against persons because you know, human rights protect persons and, and states have an obligation to protect them. Now, hate speech of this sort is not an exercise of expression. It is, in fact, it negates the space for expression. It has the effect of targeting people, silencing them, in fact, a chilling effects of, of suppressing speech and perhaps you know, throwing people out of a public space that they can't express themselves out of fear of what happen, happened to them because of the hatred expressed towards them. Yes, of course, there's also a point that these false claim meet the real claim. That is, when the blasphemy laws, the existence with draconian penalties embolden individuals to, to incite violence against those alleged to have offended religious beliefs, and therefore through that create, if you like, you know, vigilante action against those who would have insulted, insulted people's beliefs. And this is the commonest form through which anti-blasphemy laws exact the little toll. Like I said, not so much state penalties, but by in the hands of private actors. So the lesson from this to those who advocate for the anti-blasphemy laws is to recognize that, that it is they who are opening up a path to violence and hatred, not those who would speak offensively or critically of their beliefs and religion. And to insert religion has rarely, if ever, caused violence without someone else inciting violence against the person who allegedly has spoken those words. And there is, if you look at previous instances, there's typically a time lag, huge time lag between the offensive speech and the subsequent mobilization against that person by, by another, another person who actually is inciting violence against those people. Now, concern about hate speech, of, of course, legitimate and must be combated uh, in, 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 you know, within the framework of international human rights law for which there is ample guidance. I have been shocked by the upsurge of hatred uh, towards Jewish communities around the world in the past month or so. Um, 
you know, including, of course, attacks on people who are visibly seen to be Jewish or people running through uh, neighborhoods known to be Jewish with hateful, insightful, uh, you know, speech. As I am also um, shocked by this attack recently in, in London, Ontario, uh, on a Muslim family, largely because they were uh, Muslim, and as well as, of course, the ongoing, the, the almost daily uh, attacks on um, at, 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 attacks on Ahmadis and Christians in Pakistan, for example, or the hatred against the Baha'i that the government of Iran perpetrates, or in fact the you know quite a pervasive. Uh, incitement to violence, uh, homophobic violence against members of the LGBT plus community. So all these forms of uh, hatred, whether they target religions or use religion, but in ways that harm people should be challenged and co combated. That's why I have dedicated so much of my time to talking about combating anti-blasphemy, anti-conversion laws, and laws that prohibit various forms of expression, such as, you know, of course, homophobia. What we require to do is to pursue a mix of measures. There must, of course, be accountability demanded of states uh, against persons who perpetrated these acts. And if states fail to hold them to account, we must find ways to hold these states to account for where they fail uh, to in enforce the law and protect everybody. At the same time, we must also pursue measures to you know, foster a climate of tolerance and build resilience in society through solidarity, through education, awareness raising, including about standards of human rights that need to be protected by all states, including the area of hate speech and religious freedom. And of course, most important of all is that we must be focused on supporting, protecting those who are victimized by these laws. While at the same time, we also pursue measures uh, for the future to prevent such violations from, from occurring. I think this, this range of mix of measures is essential if we are to successfully combat against the toxic effects of anti-blasphemy laws and other laws that restrict uh, expression by, as a way of suppressing religious freedom in that society. I shall end there, uh, Marvin. Thank you. Uh, thanks very, very much, Ahmed. Can, can I, you know, uh, we have had a question that, that came in um, actually in, in advance from, from one of the states, but saying uh, the question is what are the biggest challenges to overcome in preventing and combating hate speech? and incitement to violence. How can we make a breakthrough in tackling this? Now, you talked, um, you might want to answer that more generally, but you talked there about um, holding states to account. How would you suggest that we, uh, that we hold states to account? What practical action are you talking about? Magnitsky type sanctions or, 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 or what? Absolutely, I think uh, the Magnitsky type sanctions is an important tool to be used against um, you know, state actors who actively you know, uh, enforce these laws. So judges who enforce death penalty clearly you know, for, need, need to fall in this category. As I would, I think government leaders who actually incite violence and there are plenty of, uh, unfortunately, leaders like that. And uh, I suppose even um, it can go down to parliament. Those have an active role in, sub in calming people through, through these laws, I think should, should attract some penalty. And I, what I mean is, targeted sanctions that attack or target them, not the state in general. Um, so that is vitally important. At the same time, those uh, who fail to do their duty, because oftentimes how this laws effect is by through impunity, by state allowing uh, non-state actors to carry out uh, you know, violent actions with zero cost to them. So those who fail to hold these people to account must also be you know, through a mix of pressure, naming and shaming, and something more substantive in terms of real impact on, on, on their, on their I suppose, you know, metrics of cost and benefit. Yeah, thank you. J just one other quick question. Um, obviously, when it comes to hate speech, um, we, we, we must include in that hate speech that comes over social media. Um, so in other words, words, um, which is the, the same as speech, of course. But, um, you know, uh, uh, um, how is there a role a positive role for social media in combating hate speech generally, uh, not just on social media, but, but, you know, how can we use social media for good in this respect, do you think? Um, yes, a very important question, because, you know, one of the best ways to counter hateful speech by promoting counter speech. So I think increasing access to communities who are marginalized or who are then, you know, being marginalized by such speech is important. There are a variety of ways doing this. That's one. Now, there is ways of trying to promote access to, I suppose, appropriate information. Now, in the case of Holocaust denial, um, now there are ways in which people who post these things or look for these will get directed to 
sites which are not hate hate sites, not denial sites. So ways of ways of increasing access to information, um, increasing literacy in terms of religions and societies, but also digital literacy itself is an important one. And of course, in regard to you know social media, it's vitally important for the uh, social media companies to be more accountable, more transparent in the way they address these complaints, in the way they moderate uh, content, in how much they invest in ensuring that they also look at those communities where the language is perhaps you know, not a majority one and making sure that they prioritize their resources on protecting those who are most vulnerable rather than a general you know, approach. I think they can prioritize those who are most at risk and then look at ways of protecting them. At the same time, of course, fostering more information flow uh, that will enable respect for diversity, understanding of diversity, and knowing about the other, in, in a, perhaps in a more direct sense. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So thank you so much for the answer. Let's let's move on to our to our second speaker today, and uh, we're really pleased to have with us Dr. Jan Figel, um, who was the EU's former special envoy for promotion of freedom of religion um, outside of the EU. Um, he held that position from 2016 to 2019. Um, he was a founder member of the Christian Democratic Movement and was elected in 2009 as the leader of the uh, CDM in Slovakia. Um, Dr. Figel has held high levels of office within the Slovak government, including State Secretary for Ministry of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he was the chief negotiator of Slovakia's accession into the EU. And uh, so welcome, Dr. Figel. We look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you. We can't hear you. No, we still can't. We could hear you earlier. Okay, I think I think um, Ian, Ian is just going out and coming back in again. Um, I wonder if we should go to our next speaker, I think probably, and we'll come back to uh, to Jan in a moment. So um, our next speaker is, is Fiona Bruce, Member of Parliament for um, Congerton. Um, Jan uh, uh, Fiona has been, uh, uh, has been an outspoken uh, voice for human rights and freedom of religion and belief ever since she came into Parliament in 2010. Uh, but in December of last year, um, Fiona was appointed by the Prime Minister of the UK to be um, his special envoy for freedom of religion or belief. And uh, she's, as I say, she's been a tireless voice in this area. And one of the, one of the things that she has, um, one of her major tasks as the Prime Minister's special envoy is of course, um, uh, going through the Truro report um, recommendations. And uh, there are 22 recommendations there, which she's working her way through. Uh, but we're thrilled that Fiona's come in to speak to us this afternoon and, uh, and welcome Fiona, thank you. Well, good afternoon and thank you, Mervyn and Christian Solidarity Worldwide for inviting me to, to join this panel, uh, a panel on which I feel something of an interloper, bearing in mind the, the extensive expertise on FORB of my fellow panellists, as you've already heard uh, from Ahmed, and uh, you've still got former Ambassador Sam Brownbank to come, and I hope Jan Figel too. Uh, but I want to spend the next few minutes focusing on the particularly distressing impact of living in the shadows of COVID-19 experienced by people who already live in extreme poverty and are marginalized because of their religion or beliefs, of the acute challenges many of them have faced during this pandemic, and to suggest some ways in which help could be provided to help them address those challenges, and in some instances where this is already being provided by the UK. Now, fortunately, in speaking to you today, 
I am able to draw on the authoritative research recently carried out by an organization called Creed, the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development. This research was commissioned by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office on the challenges during the pandemic faced by religious minorities living in West Africa and South Asia. And the Creed research demonstrates how religious inequalities intersect with other inequalities, some historical, some structural, and with social characteristics such as class, ethnicity, caste, gender, and age. And how all of these exacerbate how some of the poorest people and therefore least resilient in crisis have had to endure the COVID-19 pandemic. The research speaks of the loss of subsistence livelihoods for the most marginalised farmers unable to take perishable goods to market because of travel restrictions, women unable to sell milk due to market closures, or of domestic or street workers shut out of their jobs due to lockdowns, of how the scapegoating of Muslims accused of being COVID-19 spreaders, sometimes even involving harassment or beatings, has made them fearful of leaving home and consequently lost them their livelihoods, of how they are often reluctant even to report such discrimination to authorities for fear of reprisals, of how Christian families who've had to leave their homes and farms during the pandemic then face living in overcrowded conditions where health and hygiene challenges and fear of COVID infection are severely heightened during a pandemic. The report speaks of how for many the loss of their religious community-based support, sometimes their only social safety net, such as through Hindu temples, due to those having been closed during the pandemic, has exacerbated the, the economic impact of COVID-19 on these religious minority groups. And so too has the fact that in, in some countries, religious identity shapes the level of government assistance available. And even where this may be available for religious minorities, fear of harassment or attack can act as a deterrent from accessing the necessary services to stay healthy through the pandemic. A key impact of living in the shadows of COVID-19 has, has been on the mental health of people and particularly devastatingly so for the already poor and marginalised. Described in the Creed report as, as living constantly filled with fear, anxiety and insecurity, suffering distress, depression and despair due to hunger and loss of breadwinners and livelihoods, worrying about feeding their children, about debt, a greater risk of domestic or other violence, exhausted by targeting ostracization or fear of COVID-19 infection with limited, if any, access to health services or social support. We hear concerningly of the widespread loss of schooling for marginalized children, meaning that the impact of COVID-19 will be felt by this generation, not only today, but potentially for many years to come. And the Creed report notes particularly that the impact of the pandemic going forward may mean that where resources for schooling are scarce, boys' education could be prioritised over girls. In the face of such challenges, what help can be offered? What solutions can be suggested? And what contributions can the UK make towards these? Educating girls is one of the best investments we can make to help lift people out of poverty. So the UK is helping many more girls into school in a number of places, including Nigeria, as well as investing to assist women in developing countries to build resilient businesses. And the UK government is ensuring that our human rights work addresses specific issues, such as gender-based violence experienced by women from religious minority communities. Crucially too, Equitable access to vaccines around the world will help ensure that no one is left behind after this pandemic, which is why the UK has provided over half a billion pounds to a global vaccines programme, which has now delivered more than 87 million doses across six continents. And multilateralism, working together as nations, 
is key to addressing the effects of this pandemic, including on the four marginalised. And that's why I welcome last week's G7 Open Society Leaders Statement, committing countries to work together to promote FORB and the joint statement to the same effect by Prime Minister Boris Johnson and President Biden in the New Atlantic Treaty, as well as the commitment by G7 foreign ministers to coordinate action and target support on defending FORB going forward. And it's too why I'm pleased as the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief to be the UK representative on the Alliance of 33 Nations, the International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance, founded by former Ambassador Sam Brownbank. Our alliance responded proactively with a joint statement to protect the right to FORB during the pandemic. But why is protecting the right to freedom of religion or belief so important and not just during the pandemic? It is because an individual's faith or beliefs lie at the very essence of their being. They are what make us human. So to discriminate against, to persecute, to attack another person on account of their religion or beliefs is to strike at the very core of their humanity. And whilst the Creed report speaks of, of groups, such groups are of course made up of individuals, of men, women and children. Each one, like all of us here today, with individual hopes and aspirations. And so for me, the heart of defending freedom of religion or belief is based on respecting the unique worth of every human being. It is about the importance of treating every individual with dignity. It is about saying, you matter, you have purpose, you are significant, wherever you are in the world, whatever your faith or none, you are not forgotten, you are not disregarded, you are not overlooked. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona, for that powerful uh, speech. Uh, I, I just want to ask you, I'm going to ask you one question. It's a big question, just, a, just an all-encompassing question almost. If, if there's one issue about promoting FORB uh, you'd like to see changed, uh, what would it be? Good question. <laughs> I'd like to see FORB introduced into education. Uh, across the world. Um, we've heard already from Ahmed that uh, abuses of FORB are uh, global and increasing. And if we can help young people understand uh, the scale and severity of this problem, if they can catch hold of how they could be uh, agents for change in their own communities, uh, if they can do so in a way that they've caught hold of the importance of addressing climate change, then I think in their generation going forward, we could see a different world. Well, it, it, what an excellent answer. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. It has to start, doesn't it, in, in the children. And, and, and the, the education obviously includes some of the textbooks, which include some of the hate speech that Dr. Shahid was talking about earlier that are even included in, in textbooks in some of these countries. Uh, but of course, we have to recognise too, um, those of us who are activists and uh, as, as we all are on this call today, we have to recognise that um, uh, when you're talking about education, uh, we don't always see the results of that for a generation. It takes time and we have to be patient. But uh, that's an excellent answer. Thank you, Fiona. I'm hoping that um, Jan is going to be, we're all going to hear you now, Jan. I'm, I'm not going to yeah. do your introduction again. It was, uh, no, no, no. Uh, but we, we, we know who you are. Thank you. We can hear you. Uh, so, uh, so over to you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Oh, great. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry for the technicalities. And on the other side, I'm glad that Fiona Bruce got preference and uh, I could listen to her uh, message and uh, wish all the panelists and also all attendees uh, useful and inspiring uh, event. First of all, I want to appreciate Mervyn, your role and uh, your role and, and uh, CSW because 
uh, it shows a, a great uh, professionality and very strong lasting commitment to FORP for all. Thank you, really. I know what I say. I, I keep in memory my visit to your headquarters in London. I hope it was not the last. Uh, I'm also glad that European Union continues in the mission uh, which I pioneered and was in, let's say, more dramatic times of uh, genocidal mass atrocities in the Middle East, especially Syria and Iraq, because for, for all is important. And the messages from Ahmed Shahid were also quite uh, striking about the worsening uh, restrictions. So the need is there. Uh, the, the alliance of uh, good willing or, or those ready to act uh, is also there now. And many European countries are part of it. And I'm glad that uh, we can state it. Uh, I have selected a topic on uh, religious leaders uh, because I think it's important contribution to what we need to achieve or understand. Uh, it is something what uh, I want to connect with for as, as objective, because whenever we speak about freedom, we should understand it's only one side of the coin and the other side of the coin is responsibility. So whenever I met uh, smaller or bigger uh, local or even international uh, leadership uh, of uh, faith communities, um, I always dwelt on the connection between freedom and responsibility. And second uh, comment which I brought from Lebanon from Adian Foundation was experience with the religious leaders that when the foundation tried to develop a common understanding of uh, basic values, basic objectives, they agreed on uh, nine values or nine issues, but uh, the last, the 10th was missing. And the 10th uh, uh, problematic uh, framework was for how to understand the freedom of religion or belief by religious leaders. So it speaks by itself that uh, it's a sensitive issue but again, very important principle for any positive change in this field. Actually, we speak here about freedom of thought, conscience and religion or belief. And it's a fundamental and expansive right for every human being and, uh, and community. And as we know that human rights are invisible, freedom of religion or belief is an essential ingredient for cohesive societies, for conflict resolution for building of more effective coalitions which serve peace. If FORB is violated, all human rights agenda suffers, be it political or civil rights, economic, social, cultural rights. Let me insist on one crucial point. There is no confrontation between individual and collective rights. What we need to underline is that freedom of religion or belief is a right for all. It is a justice, justice for all. Uh, religions themselves do not need protection, but individuals and communities are the rights holders. When we speak on four or common values, my advice is to stress and promote human dignity. In Arabic, it's said karama. Human dignity is at the very core of the universal human rights and values agenda, and is also value shared by major religions. This was my, my learning experience and uh, kind of opening to sensitive uh, dialogues. Actually, uh, human dignity is a meeting place for both the religious and secular humanists. Article one of the UDHR says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. There is a nexus, nexus between form and human dignity. And a few uh, historical connections from the religious uh, or secular side. In 1965, the Declaration on Religious Freedom by the Second Vatican Council, Dignitatis Humanae, stated, I quote, the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person. European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights from 2000 puts human dignity on the first position within the list of fundamental values and protects human dignity through its first article in the very first chapter. 
In the Declaration of Fundamental Freedoms from January 2012, the group of Al-Azhar scholars and Egyptian intellectuals defined the relationship between the general principles of the Islamic Sharia and basic freedoms adopted international by, by international conventions. Freedom of belief comes, according to this declaration, first, as I quote, the cornerstone in the modern social structure. And it is put there on the first place just before freedom of opinion and expression. And it is associated to the right of full citizenship for all. Very important. Besides responsibility of states and governments, uh, like in Nigeria today, Eritrea, Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, we need to see more often and more active involvement of diverse religious leaders. Closer to Indonesia, I can mention the philosophy of Pancasila, which has governed for over 75 years the people of Indonesia and Indonesians as ardent supporters of the idea of universalism and human dignity. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, Western Balkans, key religious uh, leaders, whether Catholics, Orthodox, or Muslims, have much higher public credibility than any politician. And this represents also their potential and responsibility to give people real hope and peaceful vision. Many promising initiatives are connecting uh, human rights and religious actors, especially in the last five, day, five years. I can mention maybe three because there are many more, but these three are quite exemplary. Uh, in 2016, January, Marrakesh Declaration was adopted. Uh, as a statement by more than 250 Muslim religious leaders, heads of state and scholars. The conference in Morocco was called in response to the persecution of religious minorities, such as Christians and Yazidis by uh, famous uh, and, and a very bloody ISIS. The declaration has been widely welcomed. Special role was played by Sheikh Bimbaya and King Mohammed VI of Morocco. Uh, the important part of the initiative is subsequent implementation, of course. I wish to praise also the Faithful Rights Initiative, supported by the UN in March 2017 in the so-called Beirut Declaration and its 18 commitments. 18 uh, recalls uh, article number 18 in the UDHR faithful rights with 18 commitments. This is a joint effort by faith-based and secular civil society actors, all working in the field of human rights and expressing their deep conviction that human rights and faith are mutually reinforcing. And thirdly, I'd like just to mention Abu Dhabi Declaration on Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. It is a joint statement signed by Pope Francis and Sheikh Ahmed uh, El Tajib, Grand Imam of Al Azhar, in February 2019 in Abu Dhabi. It was born on a repetitive and open fraternal discussions between authorities of, of uh, Catholic Christianity and Sunni Islam, so the major communities. And it is meant to be a guide on advancing a culture of mutual respect on the base of the document the Higher Committee on Human Fraternity has been established. So these are uh, praiseworthy uh, initiatives and we need to, to continue. Weaker side of these initiatives, regrettably, is their due implementation, how to credibly translate words into deeds, because words are calling, but deeds are moving. I always remind it to religious leaders, as I said, that they are right holders and duty bearers. Bringing closer human rights and religion can open innovative and unexpected common grounds. And when we define, when we design common ground, we find common words, common interests, and then very important common good. We know that several countries like Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Indonesia, Oman are moving in this area. I can only encourage others to do so as well. It is only by discovering the religious others that we can understand and construct sustainable trust and peace.
Inter-religious cooperation requires professional, innovative approach and goodwill. It needs uh, time and it's a long-term endeavor. European Union is open, keen and interested in working with religious and social and, and civil society actors in this area. Let me conclude my reflection with, with you. Evil in each society and in each time has several, uh, but preferably three main allies, indifference, ignorance, and fear. When we don't care, when we don't know or understand, and when we are scared to do something to raise uh, voice in, uh, in, uh, for, for justice in the world. Therefore, we must get engaged to understand and learn, and we need courage to act jointly for justice. Faith-based organizations and religious leaders today can play an important role internationally and nationally for a better world. Pew Research Center speaks about overwhelming majority of global population, up to 84% claiming religious affiliation. So it is important. It's not a minor issue. And, and this share is growing. So faith-based organizations and religious leaders live uh, a unique moment in history uh, where they can become exemplary and inspiring. People do not reach too much encyclicals or fatwas, but they see pictures and follow media when joint meetings and statements of, for example, already mentioned Pope Francis and Grand Imam of al azhar have their very important influence in many nations. It makes impact against religious fundamentalism and eliminates space for violent extremism. I wish very sincerely religious leaders to lead by example towards culture of dialogue, coexistence, shared responsibility. We must learn how to live together in diversity, not only to exist because to live together is more than to exist together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. I, I, I'm, I'm very conscious that um, our last speaker um, is, gonna t is, is time constrained. And so I'm, I'm going to come back to you. I have a question for you, Jan, but I'm going to come back to that after, after we've heard from Ambassador Brownback. Um, our, our last speaker, as I've just said, is Ambassador uh, Sam Brownback, who was, uh, who was the US ambassador at large for international religious freedom between uh, um, 2018 to 2000 to earlier this year. And, uh, and Ambassador Brownback is, is a giant amongst those of us who are uh, standing up for freedom of religion or belief around the world. Um, and uh, in fact, came to the office of, of um, ambassador at large uh, probably the most political, well, without doubt, the most politically experienced of all the incumbents of that office, having uh, been a congressman, a senator and governor for Kansas. Um, and of course, uh, when when he was a senator, was very much involved in the in the passing of the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act, which set up the very position that he held over the last over the last three years. So we're thrilled that Ambassador Brownback's been able to join us. He's joining us from Sudan, and so uh, um, welcome, Sam. Thanks, Irvin. Appreciate that uh, uh, very much. And you've got a great panel. Uh, these are these are folks that they know the subject, they know it very well and very deeply, and so. Uh, they've covered most of it. I want to just cover a couple of quick things. Uh, and then, like I say, I've got, to, I've got to go on to another event, and I apologize about that. Number one, I want to invite everybody to an International Religious Freedom Summit. Uh, we're doing July 13th to 15th in Washington, D.C., uh, Earth Summit 2021. We hope this is going to be an annual event of getting together people concerned and interested from civil society and religious uh, groups uh, to come together and participate and to build the networking and build the relationships that we need to press this issue forward at a grassroots level, because uh, that's what's got to happen. We've got to see this thing really go to the grassroots. Uh, second, uh, on emerging issues that I'm concerned about, uh, I'm, I'm concerned we're continuing to see genocide of religious minorities. You know, and I, I thought after the Holocaust and World War II, the Jewish people were persecuted, were killed, and the genocide that took place in the Holocaust, we, we said never again. But we continue to see it. 
uh, whether it's northern Iraq towards the Yazidis and Christians, or whether it's the Uyghurs in western China or other places, we continue to see it. And I think we've got to watch that miss that that hurtful view of religious minorities. The answer is religious freedom for everybody, everywhere, all the time. And then a final point that I want to make is the misuse of te technology. I'm deeply concerned about the, the emerging use of facial recognition systems, uh, of uh, even digitizing uh, all of the uh, currency so that all transactions can be followed or stopped if they don't like what religious affiliation that you have. Uh, and I think we've really got to watch this, particularly in Western countries, about this misuse of technology for religious oppression. Uh, Merv, thank you for allowing me to be a, a short part of this. You've got a great set of panelists, and uh, I wish you all well and Godspeed. I can't hear you, Merv. Sorry, I, I'm not going to let you go without asking one quick question. You know, you're you're the great campaigner amongst us, and and, and, and you know, one of my big things that I've been doing this for a long while is is we talk a lot about this, but but we don't see action, and and we need, uh, and everybody's talking about this. You know, we need to see action that's going to make a difference. And I know what is, you've made some great initiatives over the last three years. One of which, of course, was. Uh, Fiona referred to the International Religious Freedom and Belief Alliance and also the round tables that you're setting up uh, around the world. You know, do you do you see these uh, as, as places where actually we can stop talking and, and, and really make a difference? I really do. One's a grassroots effort, the round tables. Uh, the uh, one that Fiona is on is at the the rooftops, I and mean, that's countries, but it is finally countries coming together around a human right. And I think as we get these structures in place and then they push forward, we can really start to see action. I'm sorry, I've got to jump off. God bless you all. Take care. Thanks, Sam. Thank you for joining us. Cheers. Okay, um, we've, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, let me let me come back to, to you, Jan, um, when you were uh, following up from your your talk, you know, um, religious leaders are often uh, de facto community leaders and, and activists um, where they take a stand for their communities against violations. We see this so often. It's religious leaders so often that, that take that stand. They, they take the brunt of harassment. What more can the international community do to recognize religious leaders as human rights defenders? Uh, I think that uh, what I said before uh, is worth to repeat because people don't read too much uh, uh, religious uh, texts or declarations, but uh, they see pictures, they see messages in media. And it's important that, that religious leaders in their diversity, in their differences are seen together in dialogue, in openness, and shared responsibility. And I think that uh, international community, whether the UN as umbrella or, or uh, regional organizations or individual states should encourage such trends. It's important. I mentioned one particular part of, uh, of Western Balkans, which was full of conflicts uh, 20 years ago, and there was also genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And, uh, and uh, religious leaders are, are listened to very uh, carefully and with a lot of uh, expectation. And that's important that this uh, potential is used for peace and real uh, peaceful coexistence, justice for all in that part of, of uh, Europe, which was so troubled in the previous century, including, as I mentioned, recent genocide, Srebrenica. Uh, this is a good example, a kind of litmus test. And when I was there as uh, EU special envoy, uh, I uh, witnessed how much they expect also understanding uh, joint effort uh, with and uh, from Brussels, from European Union. And that, that was very encouraging signal, but it's not, you know, fait accompli, it's not a deal done. 
it's a process and, and we need to involve these communities and uh, overcome the past and the divisions of the past and even uh, atrocities which are so recent. And that's interest of, of states, of uh, uh, international institutions, including European Union and United Nations. Thank you so much, Dr. Figal. I think, oh, Mervyn's back. I was just gonna jump in with a question, but um, I'll let him come back in. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I, no problem. I don't know what happened. I found I was the only person on the screen, so uh, I thought you'd all left me. Um, do you finish answering that, Jan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I finished. It's okay. I mean, I, mean uh, I, I leave the space for others. Okay, thank you. And would anybody else like to follow up on that, on that, um, on that, you know, religious leaders as human rights defenders? I think okay. one of the, sorry, no, carry on. Mervyn. No, no, go, no, you carry on. I think one of the, one of the effective ways that um, uh, we're, we're working in the UK is through something that you're aware of, Mervyn, which is the UK for Forum. Uh, which brings together now representatives uh, from over 70 organizations, NGOs, uh, faith leaders, uh, charities, community groups, uh, denominations, uh, to dialogue, talk, share best practice, and, and really uh, begin to understand how uh, together we can highlight the importance of form across our various communities. And I think that's one of the ways in which that exchange of views and exchange of ideas um, has enabled a, a number of religious leaders that I see to, to actually uh, connect with the broader uh, communities in society, not just with their own particular congregations. Yep, okay, yep, thank you. I, I um, We're coming towards the end, but I, I, we, we've, We've only got one question um, left in the, in the chat. Um, and it's a follow-up question for you, Fiona. Um, the questioner says, um, fully agree with mainstream in FORB literacy, particularly in education. Um, it was also good to hear the UK's commitment towards assisting those facing discrimination due to the COVID-19. However, uh, this, is a, this is a political question. However, will the UK still be able to achieve this in light of the reduction in overseas budgets? Well, supporting, defending, promoting, protecting freedom of original belief is a human rights priority for the UK. And as I see uh, the work uh, that uh, is being undertaken, for example, by Lord Ahmed, our uh, human rights minister, um, he doesn't waste an opportunity wherever he goes in the world to raise this kind of issue. And as I say, I've, uh, I've described a number of ways in which the UK is addressing abuses of freedom of religion or belief. And I'm sure it will continue uh, to be a priority as we go forward. Um, so uh, I think I can assure your, your listener that, um, that FORB is very much uh, an issue in which the UK wants to be and to continue to be uh, the global leader that it is aspires to be and has been for some time now. Okay, I, thank you. I shall, I shall certainly be doing my part to ensure that. Oh, we know that. We know that. <laughs> thank you. I mean, uh, uh, just just on thinking about, um, uh, and we've got a minute or two to spare, uh, Dr. Figuel, I mean, um, the EU haven't appointed somebody to your old position yet, have they? When's that going to uh, happen? Uh, no, no, there, there is a, a follow up. There is yeah. continuity since uh, May this year. Um, there is a, a new uh, special envoy. Oh. Uh, and, and that's uh, good news, at least in, in terms of continuity. And of course, workload is growing as well because the situation is uh, worrying, as Ahmed Shahid mentioned. Um, the name of a uh, new special envoy is Christos Stylianides, the former EU commissioner responsible for, for humanitarian crisis and migration issues. It was uh, in the previous term. So he's experienced mm -hmm. man. I, I, I wish him okay. a real commitment and, and uh, yeah. good fruits of his mission. 
Yeah. Uh, I would you. like to, to mention, uh, uh, let's say, a few issues because there are questions on blasphemy situation, the, the legislation in Pakistan and monitoring. I think it's very important to, to, to show to Pakistani people, especially minorities, but also to the uh, uh, power holders, to the government of this big and important country, that uh, uh, blasphemy uh, laws uh, is in uh, unbearable uh, situation or position. It, uh, it makes a lot of damage to, to the country since the Aul Haq's uh, regime imposed this uh, very strict, stringent uh, and mandatory um, criminalization of, uh, of, of any uh, blasphemous content uh, so-called blasphemous, because many cases are simply abuse of, of, of power or possibilities. So we need to monitor, we need to raise these issues and to use them in human rights dialogue and even uh, legal relations with Pakistan as a state. The governing party has a name movement for justice. So justice means something. A movement for justice should be visible, very active movement. So I wish that uh, at least somebody from Pakistan listens to not only to this point of Nasim Malik, but also problems of, of, of blasphemy, not only in relation to Christians, but also uh, troubled uh, Muslim uh, uh, minority who are not allowed to, to call themselves Muslim, Ahmadis, etc., etc. Uh, too much uh, uh, problem, too many problems for, for this country, for the people there. And then there was something on Nigeria and India uh, play down, playing down by the government leaders, the, the, the importance um, of um, uh, religious freedom and uh, the reality with the uh, religiously motivated attacks. I want to say that truth liberates. We need to know the truth. Uh, Christian solidarity worldwide, but also other uh, organizations provide a lot of reporting real, uh, sometimes very painful, and we need to spread this knowledge. Uh, media play a role because many times uh, they, they simply uh, do not care about such news. Uh, it's important that the people know and that we care. This is fight against, I said, and I repeat, allies of evil, indifference, ignorance, or fear. But if we know, if we understand what is going on, and we have at least minimum courage, which is civic uh, uh, principle, then I think these people have greater hope for change, for positive change. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank Sorry. You. No, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, clearly, uh, clearly, I, uh, I, I, I forgot that uh, your. <laughs> <laughs> your, uh, uh, you'd um, made an appointment to your old role, and uh, I, I missed that somehow. But uh, but I'm glad that's happening, and, and and thanks for your answer. Just just want to. I've got one quick question for for all three of you, um, and uh, and 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 that's just just come in actually. Um, but um, uh, question: How how can we combat the growing tendency? Of, uh, of government leaders in, for example, Nigeria and India to downplay religiously motivated violent attacks. This is something that we are seeing more and more. Um, how, can we, how can we combat that? Um, Dr. Shahid. Uh, thank you very much. I think we can ask for them to allow more information gathering. India, for example, has shuttered the Amnesty International doors. So I would think first up, ask them to invite me uh, or the UN envoy uh, to both Nigeria and India to look at these cases. But beyond that, I think we need to document those cases more clearly and enable those survivors to have a voice to speak about the situation. So we have the actual evidence before us uh, of, upon which, of course, governments then cannot sort of, you know, refute their claims. So I think that the response for denial is to unearth the evidence. And if the governments are saying this, they are not doing this, then they should be inviting monitors like me or my colleagues in the UN system to come and make a you know, full inspection of a visit uh, to tell us what's going on. So I think a denial by itself is not something we should accept. No, 
thank you. And I think Jan already answered that question in in uh, in, in his last in his last uh, talk. So so Fiona, you can you can finish on this one. Um, you know, it's really important, isn't it, that we that we raise our voices and that we um, uh, that we get governments to actually acknowledge the reality. And and how do, how do we how do we do that? How do we enforce this around the world? Well, I think you're right, Mervyn, and um, that's one of the uh, purposes of the alliance uh, because the collective voice of 33 countries. Uh, will resonate more loudly around the world than that of an individual country. And I think one of the things that we should be doing, certainly as an alliance, is, is where countries have signed up to uh, covenants, to international covenants, like the rights of a child or Article 18, or where their constitution actually uh, seeks to, to protect for, then we should be challenging them to abide by those commitments, uh, not to... Uh, ignore them and where for example they need to improve their justice systems uh, both through perhaps uh, the courts or um, uh, the police uh, where they need to uh, improve their law reforms where perpetrators need to be brought to justice and where victims need to be supported we need as an alliance to to call out and champion all of this so that we really can hold international counterparts uh, to uh, to their commitments Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to have to um, come to a close there. I think it's 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 encouraging um, that, um, you know, that we've 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 had a discussion this afternoon, but it's, it's encouraging not that we've just talked about it, that we've talked about solutions. We've talked about things that will make a difference. And, and you know, we do have to remember, and you quite rightly said in your uh, original talk, um, Fiona, that that we talk about religious minorities and groups of people, but groups are individuals. And, uh, and we, we are all here, all of us in the roles that we, that we variously play. Um, we are all here to make a difference in the lives. That's what we all desire to do in whatever role we're playing. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Figuel, even though you're no longer um, the, the special envoy. I'm sure this is this is a, an area that you're going to continue uh, to make your voice heard, and uh, uh, we all have to uh, stand up and speak out about these issues, don't we? So thank you so much, um, Dr. Shahid and Dr. Figuel and Fiona, for joining us and making such great contributions this afternoon. Thank you, everybody who's been with us. Those of, the, those of you um, uh, that, that have been with us, but, but perhaps know of others that would have liked to have been, um, there, there is a link somewhere, I think, where this, this has been recorded, hasn't it, Claire? So um, we will be putting out on, on, on social media, I guess, where you, can, uh, where you can find the link to this afternoon. Thank you all for your time, and, uh, and uh, I'll see you all again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all you. the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.